Welcome to the Sam Sharma Show. Today on the show, we discuss the effects of the one year anniversary of demonetization. We talk about the real reason behind the murders happening in Punjab and something big is happening in the Middle East, and we're going to talk all about it. Let's get into it. <laughs> Welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of the Sham Sharma Show. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Ah, I can smell the weekend. Now, in our first story of the show, yesterday was the first anniversary of demonetization that was undertaken by the Narendra Modi government. Now, the demonetization had three main core goals the removal of black money and the removal of the parallel black economy the removal of funding for nexels and terrorists and also the increase in gdp now we're going to talk about some statistics with regards to whether or not the bjp government was able to achieve some of these or all of these objectives but what the congress has obviously been saying and a lot of the opposition parties have been saying that this is a terrible move for the economy and it is a terrible move for the people and that it'll just lead to organized loot, as Manmohan Singh, ex-Prime Minister, recently said as well. And we're going to take a look at whether it's a fair criticism or not. Of course, it's a little rich of the uh, Congress party to be talking about organized loot and about corruption. And I'm sure they've set some sort of a record planet-wise when it comes to the amount of corruption that took place in the UPA2 regime between 2009 and 2013. Keeping in mind the cold scam, the 2G scam, the Commonwealth Games scam, the other scam, all of that crammed into that one five-year period. It's almost impressive. But anyway, let's, let's look, let's try and see if this criticism actually has value and let's try and see if the government has been able to achieve what they've set out to achieve so there's some data that came out this year about uh, gross value added by 300 odd companies which was measured and they reported their results and the gross value added by these companies grew 13 percent in the quarter which is the second quarter of financial year 18 after falling to a four quarter low of 8.4 percent in june quarter which was q1 also, the index of industrial production grew 2.6% in the first two months of Q2, up from 1.9% in the previous quarter. So it does already seem like the economy is starting to bounce back from the initial shocks of passing of GST and the passing of demonetization. Now, in other statistics, as a direct result of the demonetization initiative, about 15.2 lakh crore rupees came back into the banking system. Along with that, a very interesting statistic was that during mon demonetization, only 0.00011% of the population deposit 33% of all the cash available in the country. Now, that's a very good indication already of who was actually hardest hit by this demonetization thing. It was the people who have a lot of this cash black money lying around now high value currency also came down from 18 lakh crore to 12 lakh crore within the year now this is also particularly important because high value currency like this is the primary source of funding for terrorist organizations and nexal organizations as well now a very interesting statistic as a result of this note ban initiative as well is that stone pelting incidents in jammu and kashmir came down to 600 incidents this past year as compared to 4,000 incidents per year before demonetization. There's also been reported to be a 20% drop in Naxal activities as a result of demonetization as well. Now, in another interesting development, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs gave show cause notices to companies that have not been filing their returns. Now, what they found was that one address of one company had multiple companies registered on that address. All of these companies had their own bank accounts as well. As a result of that, the government deregistered 2.09 lakh accounts. Now, along with that, when, we, when we're looking at the poorer sections of the population, 50 lakh manual laborers had new accounts created, one crore laborers were added to the Provident Funds and Employee State Insurance Corporation as well. 84.21 new taxpayers were added to the system. But that is a lot of people and that is a lot of revenue for the government as well that they can then use for public works, 
and again, money that's come into the system and money that can be added to the GDP. Along with that, digital transactions increased from 87 crore to 138 crore. That's a pretty big jump to take in one year. And there was a study done by Moody Analytics of the United States, and they found that electronic payments added $296 billion in real dollars to GDP in the 70 countries studied between 2011 and 2015. The money is traceable, it goes back into the banking system, and it is added to the GDP as well. For example, big increases in GDP were recorded in Hungary, the United Arab Emirates, Chile, Ireland, Poland and Australia, and this was due to card usage, irrespective of economic performance. And I think this is a very good indicator as well. Now again, due to increased deposits in banks, the interest rates have also fallen. That makes it easier for people to get loans for houses and to be able to buy houses, in addition to the help they get from the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana. Again, also to reiterate, the cash that was sitting in people's houses, either in a mattress or in the pillows or in safes, that's of your no use to the economy, that's of no use to anyone. The money that is made in an economy is only useful if more money is made off of that money. Another benefit of removing that cash is that after that removal, the political campaign budgets will also become more reasonable. I think there has definitely been some shocks to the economy and particularly to the poorer sections of the population when it comes to demonetization. But it is said that the difference between good economics and bad economics is that Good economics tends to focus on the long run and bad economics tends to focus on the short run. And sure, like I said, there has been some problems in the short run uh, and the effect particularly on the poorer sections of the population has been bad. But I think in the longer run, more laborers being inducted into the formal banking system and getting bank accounts so they can get insurance, so they can get loans for homes through the Pradhan Mantri Awaz Yojana as well. And all of this money being added to the GDP and coming into the banking system, I think these are all signs that bode really well for the economy in the long run. And I think future generations will really benefit from the steps that have been taken as part of this demonetization drive. And that's gonna be my question of the day to you as well. What do you think about demonetization? Do you think that demonetizations actually help the economy? Or do you think that demonetization in the short run has hurt people and the economy too much. So let me know in the comments below. All right, now next story, the Punjab government came out and said that they've actually had a crack in the case of a series of murder committed on people mainly belong belonging to Hindu organizations. Now the chief minister of Punjab came out and he said that there is definitely an ISI hand in this and ISI might be funding uh, Khalistani radicals to commit these murders. Now he was referring to the killings of Amit Arora, Shiv Sena leader Durga Das Gupta, RSS leader Jagdish Gagneja, Sri Hindu Takht official Amit Sharma, Dera Sacha Sauda followers Satpal and Ramesh Kumar, Pastor Sultan Masih, and RSS leader Ravinder Gosain. Now the CBI had been looking into these murders as well and they were thinking that Khalistani terrorists might have something to do with these murders too because the style in which these murders are carried out is people approach the person that they're about to murder on motorcycles with their faces covered and they shoot them at point blank range and that style of murder is very reminiscent of the Khalistani insurgents when they would murder and target mainly Hindus to create more polarization in the state. Now Pakistani support for the Khalistani movement isn't much of a secret because Pakistan knows full well that a united Sikh and Hindu front cannot be defeated. And so the best strategy for Pakistan along with creating problems in Kashmir is to also create a rift between Sikhs and Hindus. Now over the past year, year or so, we've seen that the army has been eliminating terrorists like flies in Kashmir. They've been very successful in taking out the top leadership of many terrorist organizations in Kashmir. On top of that, because of demonetization, as I mentioned earlier, stone pelting incidents have reduced because their funding has shrunk up. And also, now you have uh, Dinesh Sharma, who has been appointed as an interlocutor to go have talks with all involved parties in Kashmir to find a more lasting solution for Kashmir as well. So Pakistan can see India gaining a strong hand when it comes to Kashmir. So they have to change tact a little bit as well. So what they're doing is now they're using these Khalistani movement and these Khalistani radicals to create problems in South Kashmir and Punjab. Now fresh inputs from intelligence agencies in India show that Sikh extremists based in Pakistan belonging to 
Babar Khalsa International, Khalistan Commando Force, International Sikh Youth Federation. They're also getting help for making trouble in India. So I think it's pretty clear to see what Pakistan's trying to do here. And I think I wouldn't be very surprised if there was an ISI hand and Khalistani hand in all of those murders committed in Punjab recently as well. So this is definitely a situation that we should keep an eye on. And this is definitely a situation as it unfolds, I'm going to cover more in the show as well. Now from India, we go to the Middle East because there's something big happening in the Middle East right now. Now we've already talked about a little bit of this in a previous episode that you can catch up here about what's really going on in Saudi Arabia about how the crown prince Mohammed bin Salman has been consolidating power and he's been arresting a lot of these princes and a lot of these political rivals in the country as well. Another big news that came out of Saudi Arabia is the Lebanese president Saad Hariri announced his resignation from Saudi Arabia as well. He said that his life was in danger and that Hezbollah has way too much influence in the Lebanese government. Now, Hezbollah is a political outfit in Lebanon. It's a Shiite organization and it's also considered a terrorist organization by countries like the US and many countries in Europe. Now, what's important to note here is that Saad Hariri is a Sunni and Iran is now blaming Saudi Arabia of meddling in the affairs of an independent country, Lebanon. And Saudi Arabia is now accusing Hezbollah of having way too much influence in Lebanon as well. And they're saying that Iran is backing Hezbollah and therefore Iran is doing the same thing that they're accusing Saudi Arabia of doing, which is meddling in another country's internal affairs. Now, two other things have happened recently. The first is that Saudi Arabia and Saudi forces intercepted a missile, a long range missile that was headed for Riyadh and that was fired from Yemen. And the Prince Mohammed bin Salman, he said that this is regarded as an act of war because this was fired from the territory that uh, the Houthi rebels are in, which are backed by Iran. Now, the second thing this happened as well is that Syrian forces are now about to enter Abu Kamal, which is the last largest town that uh, ISIS is holding in Iraq and Syria. Now, this is very important because when Syrian forces go ahead and take Abu Kamal, uh, it'll be another huge blow to ISIS. And as the ground war against ISIS is coming to an end, one thing that's clearly happened is that Saudi Arabia has lost a lot of influence in the Middle East and Iran is now taking its place as the preeminent power in the Middle East as well. Now, there's two reasons for this. The first reason is that Saudi Arabia was often accused of propping up the ISIS regime, providing them with funding, providing them with weapons. Iran, on the other hand, has been seen as a regional power that has fought the ISIS because ISIS was a Sunni organization and they deliberately looked and hunted for Shias and minorities and Christians and Yazidis and so on and so forth. So Iran naturally backed a lot of these Shiite militant groups who were fighting ISIS and who were being supported by the Syrian government and who were being supported by Russia. So Iran, in some way, has gained a little bit of credibility as sort of this liberating force and this terrorist fighting force in the Middle East. And with Saudi Arabia as well, they've lost a lot of ground in the Middle East, particularly after ISIS's defeat. And along with that, they're, they're locked in this big war against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. And on top of that, they know that uh, the oil prices that they used to have in the previous decades and the decades before that, that's probably not going to come back, particularly because of fracking and natural gas and renewable sources of energy that are being developed, their dependence on oil might not last very long for them. So they realize now that they can't win against Iran on their own, particularly an Iran that is supported by Syria, that has support gaining in the Middle East, and that is also supported by Russia. So they need to cultivate support of their own. So they're now looking at Europe and the US to support them against Iran. And for that purpose, I think what Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, is doing is that he's saying that, look, we're ready to modernize. We will modernize our society. We will modernize our religious uh, conservatism. And that's one of the reasons why as well that he might be arresting all of these people so he doesn't f get a lot of opposition, cultural opposition and political opposition when it comes to that modernization drive to allay some of the concerns of the U.S. and the European countries. So that's basically what's happening. What's happening is that major Shia power like Iran is gaining more influence in that area. I don't know if this is necessarily good for the Middle East. It's going to be a very interesting thing to keep an eye on. I'm not 100% sure yet because there's a lot of talk right now about how 
Saudi Arabia and Iran might go to a direct war. I'm not sure that either country wants a direct war right now. This is more of like a Cold War situation. But there's definitely been a power shift in the past few years in the Middle East and how this power shift turns out, I'm not sure. This is definitely a situation that I will keep an eye on. And as this situation unfolds, we're gonna cover it on the show as well. Alrighty, and that's the show. Again, thank you for watching. I appreciate you. Now we're gonna be back on Monday with the latest news. Hopefully nothing crazy happens. Even if it does, we're gonna cover it here. You make sure you have yourself a good weekend. Do something fun, eat something nice. I know I'm going to. And again, if you're enjoying the show, give the show a like, share the show, tell friends about it and make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. The social media profiles for the show are in the description as well. So make sure to check those out and give them a like too. I will see you Monday. And until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon.